Right, before I even get to the unboxing, let me just say I'm really glad I went for the 16 gig RAM option. Just running the Mac OS without anything else takes up four and a half gig of RAM. So after that, you're really left with, I don't know, three and a half gig of RAM to play with. There are different use cases, of course, where this might be plenty, but it wasn't for me. But before you panic, do you know why? That's because I heavily rely on creative apps like Photoshop and Lightroom, for example. But even with those apps and doing quite a bit of multitasking, more than I was expecting to do, the machine performed really well. I'm Alex and I do down to earth tech videos. I just wanted to get this out there and look, I was probably doing even more than what the majority of people buying a MacBook Air would do. But keeping this as realistic as possible, running quite a few tabs in Chrome and using multiple Microsoft Office apps, you know, multiple documents within those apps, running Zoom meetings, you know, watching some content at the same time, all of, you know, without closing any apps or anything. This machine in this spec was more than capable of doing all of that. So that's the short version of the video. But as you can see here, I started by installing a couple of basic apps like, you know, Google Chrome. I don't know why I do that, it's a bit of a habit. I know uh, Richard, uh, one of my viewers asked me, why, why do you install Chrome instead of using Safari? And I think it's one of those things I just got used to, but anyway. Chrome goes in first, I then installed Creative Cloud because it's something that, again, habit. The first thing I need is PDF reader and editing PDFs. And I know what you're wondering, you know, here you go, another YouTube guy doing some unrealistic tests. Well, I do want to push the machine and see what the limits are and eventually do some video editing, but not today. My use case is very niche, so I appreciate, you know, and I want to replicate as much as possible a more realistic use case, you know, because I know that's what you're going to care about. Creative Cloud is just, the, you know, so I can use some, some of my apps like Photoshop and and Lightroom just for some basic photo editing. But in this video and the next one, I'll be sharing some more relevant MacBook Air workflows. In my live stream yesterday, I got quite a few great suggestions, but I'm, I'm still accepting ideas by the way. So let me know what you'd like to see, you know, in terms of what I would like to test here and compare against. Just installing Creative Cloud and only installing Photoshop in Lightroom, because obviously with Creative Cloud, you can install 12, 15 apps, you know, of Creative, um, like. Premiere Pro and other apps. And just doing that added another one gig of RAM being utilized all the time whilst doing nothing, right? The system is just sitting idle. So even if you use an app once in a blue moon, like, you know, in the Adobe case, just having Creative Cloud does add a bunch of services to, to the machine that, you know, slowly but surely will start to, to take up that valuable RAM. I just wanted to get that out of the way before going into the next sections. I appreciate that this is gonna be a, a bit of a long video today, so I broke it down by chapters for you. If you're really in a rush for each chapter, I try to add a, a summary where, you know, where the chapter was long, I added a bit of a 30 second summary at the end. So of course it would be awesome if you watched the whole thing, but I appreciate that you might have other things to do, better things to do. <laughs> Just make sure that you are subscribed though, as I will be doing lots more tests on this machine and every new video here is gonna be dedicated to, to different areas. So the next one, for example, is gonna be dedicated to students. And apologies for the lack of visual effects today and the nice cuts that I like to add. You know, I, I really enjoy video editing, but I wanted to get this video out as quickly as possible. To, so, you know, I haven't spent a lot of time editing this in my usual way. The unboxing is great, right? I did an hour live stream where I unboxed it live and I still have that video on the channel, but I packed it all back as much as, as I could and unboxed it again so that you have a bit of a, a feel for what how it comes in the box and what's included. Because I know some people appreciate that. I certainly like to, to see how it comes out of the box and see what's included and how it feels. Overall, I thought it was a nice touch from Apple, you know, with the matching stickers. They do make it feel like, you know, you're opening a, a gift, an expensive gift, you know? Uh, well. It is bloody expensive, so. I have criticized Apple for a lot of things in the channel. I'm daily doing this, but their unboxing is top quality. You know, what is not top quality right now is how they seem to be cutting corners when choosing the internal components of this machine, for example. And I talk about that in other videos, so I won't go over that again. I'm gonna try and keep it as positive and lighthearted as possible here. The MacBook Air design is superb, right? I've always been a great fan of the ultra portables. If only the iPad OS had this, had this OS. Um, anyway, I digress a little bit, but the chassis feels really amazing. I like the wedge shape before, you know, previously that was really, really good. Some people complain about resting your palm is, is a little bit, you know, not as comfortable as it used to be with the, with a wedge uh, form factor. But for me, that didn't make a, a big difference. My forearms, they sort of rest 
on the desk so my wrist really doesn't really touch the laptop too much but listen this is not this is a personal thing right that's how i work that's how i rest my my forearms here some people will be a little bit more leaning on top of the laptop i did notice though that this lid opening here just below the trackpad um let's see if i can hopefully you can see on both angles yeah, this bit here, it's, it's a minor thing, but it does feel a bit rougher, a tiny bit rougher than the MacBook Pro that I've got. I've got the M1 Max here and my wife has the M1 Pro as well. So I'm kind of familiar to how it feels. It feels a bit smoother than the M2 MacBook Air. When it comes to the color, again, it's tricky to make justice here on the camera, but I hope you can get a feel for it. I absolutely love, you know, this color. It's, it's super classy for me. I do like my space gray and, you know, the darker tones. And I know that that midnight color looks amazing from what I've seen online, but I don't know. I really like this very faint gold color. You know, it reminds me a little bit of the, the iPhones, the older iPhones, the, like the 7S, I think had a, had a similar gold. When it comes to convenience, well, this is the computer for convenience, right? This is so light that you really don't have any limits as to where you can work. You can be anywhere really, you know, plop this on your lap and off you go. I do feel like getting a case or at least a, a protection of some sort will be important. So for me, I ordered a, a D brand skin. If you don't know what those are, these kind of adhesive uh, skins and they're quite fun. So I, I'm gonna try that for a bit. And I also have a sleeve, you know, which I think might be a better idea in the, in the long run. I've got this one here, which is a, a leather one, fantastic quality from Walnut. I did a review of it in many ways. From a convenience point of view, this laptop ticks many, many boxes. The battery seems incredible as well. I'll talk about it more uh, towards the end. But you know, even having the display on full brightness, pretty much since I've got it, the battery barely moved. I mean, it's now, well, it's now connected to the power, but I, I looked earlier, after about four hours of usage, it only went down to about 75%. So it, it really holds up. I'm pretty sure you'll be able to work all day, if not more, uh, with this machine. The keyboard feels amazing as well. And I'm not sure you can hear this, but this is amazing. I'll try to record a little bit here. I don't know if that worked, but anyway, I think they've really done something different here with this keyboard because it certainly feels a, a bit tighter to type on. It's hard to explain, but the switches feel a bit more resistant when, when you're typing it. And I don't know, when you're pushing down the keys, it feels a, a little bit more resistant in comparison to the MacBook Pro, for example. Although the travel distance seems shorter than the, the M1 Max MacBook Pro that I've got here. But as I said, the resistance is higher. Overall though, what that translates into is, is a very pleasing uh, experience. All right, with all those nice things out of the way, let's talk about the juicy stuff. Let's, you know, how does it perform? As I said at the beginning of the video, I think it's a fantastic machine and it performs really well for doing even more than what I thought it could do. To recap, this is the eight core 256 gig SSD with 16 gig RAM M2 MacBook Air. That took me about 10 minutes to say. Anyway, I honestly believe that 16 gig should be the minimum these days for, for a lot of people, including myself. But to be fair to Apple, when we're talking about the MacBook Air, a gig will go a long way. I've seen some examples here of, of multitasking where when it gets to a certain point, even the 16 gig, it doesn't automatically just add, you know, to the memory usage. It does, you know, Mac OS does something to, to manage it. Um, it, was, it was very interesting to see, of course, you get memory pressure, it starts to creep up and also get swap going on. I, got, I managed to get swap going on here, but it took a lot of multitasking, lots of tabs open. Anyway, we'll talk about it in a minute. To start with, you know, once I had about five tabs in Chrome, Photoshop and Lightroom open, which I know it's, it's, a, it's a common thing to do, but not many people will do it. But I did it because I wanted to see, you know, how, how much those apps take in memory. With one project in each, so I had, you know, one photo being edited at, at one time, uh, the memory went up to 11 gig, right? Just as two apps and a few tabs in, in Chrome. Using a more realistic case, I went to about 15 tabs in Chrome, using some fairly interactive websites as well, not just opening the same website or, or websites are just news, right? I had news, I had videos like YouTube and Netflix, shopping, Amazon and Etsy, for example, some social media stuff, LinkedIn and things like that. And then I opened some basic apps, right? You know, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, all those basic things that people do all the time on a MacBook Air. And at the same time, I run a couple of Zoom meetings as well, just to see if it would, you know, if, if I would see any drop frames or any uh, kind of lagging or any sluggish performance between the other apps. 
I didn't see any of that. With those basic apps, you know, they, they were consuming not even a gig, right? Probably even like 300 meg of memory. So they, they are really good in terms of how much they consume. Those productivity apps don't tend to, to consume a lot of RAM. I was downloading documents from OneDrive, for example. So it wasn't just kind of local, you know, it was kind of working as you would normally, right? Updating, updating the documents as well, wasn't just opening them. Trying to simulate the real work as much as possible. It really didn't matter though how many of those standard apps I used. The ones that really kind of stick out a little bit like a sore thumb are the Adobe ones. Of course, these are professional level applications like Lightroom and Adobe Photoshop, and they are expected to take a lot of memory. But as soon as I close Photoshop and Lightroom, you can see immediately that the memory usage does go down to kind of a more manageable level. And the memory pressure as well goes back to green. I then went to about 16 tabs, if not more. And I still have those tabs open right now. Let's just see what it's doing now. I've got about 20 tabs now open and it's, it's using 14 gig of RAM as well as all the other apps that I've got open here, including Photoshop and Lightroom. So I'm pushing this machine and I haven't noticed anything from a performance point of view yet. So closing Photoshop in Lightroom does show that the memory goes back to green and reopening Lightroom in Photoshop shows again that the memory pressure goes up again, which is to be expected, right? And you can see that the memory being used by those two apps combined was about five gig. Mac OS is doing a great job though, and you can see that even some swap was starting to happen here. When I was having all of these apps open and all of those tabs, you know, using external monitor as well to try to replicate as much as possible a normal usage of someone working in a desk. You know, the machine just felt incredible. You know, I couldn't, I could be working off of my M1 Max and I wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Watching content, editing photos, you know, kind of basic photos, switching between apps, all just worked really flawlessly. I then wanted to test the, you know, kind of this low SSD issue. This is the 256 gig that's generated so much noise online. I've made a couple of videos about this. And as my prediction kind of, you know, I was saying beforehand, for a normal usage, even with all the multitasking that I was doing, this hard drive is not an issue. I tried to move about 100 gig files from a folder from an external SSD drive, this guy here, into the laptop. And again, whilst multitasking, didn't have to close anything. There's something that happens though that I, I should call out, right? And it happened in the live stream as well yesterday. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is an issue. It's not, it's normal. After about 50 gig of data transferred, the transfer goes back to, I don't know, from 1.4 gig or over a gig a second, which is really fast. To down to about 130 sometimes, even below 100, it then eventually settles again at about 200 megs per second. This is an extreme use case, right? Not many people with a MacBook Air will be trying to transfer that much data every day. Maybe you do that once, you know, to transfer music or photos from old machines into the new one, then you're probably not, never gonna do that again. So anyway, there's a lot involved in here in what the machine is doing, and I need to learn about that myself. There's something called SLC cache, which causes that slow down, um, but when you're transferring a 60 gig folder instead, it's like some, a little bit more manageable, still extreme though. But as you can see in the example here, it took a few seconds, literally a few seconds to get to 50 gig. So it's doing an amazing job to move those 50 gig really, really fast. And it sustained that transfer speed, you know, at 1.5 gig at one point for a long time. But again, when it got to 50 gig, it slowed down. And then the last 10 gig, it, it moved at a much slower speed. Still did the whole thing in, I don't know, a minute or so. So it seems that there is a 50 gig threshold at which point the computer seems to slow down the, the file transfer. The performance itself, you know, the multitasking was not impacted. I could carry on working. Some of my kind viewers yesterday explained to me that, you know, this SLC cache is what I need to look into. And I'll be honest with you, I haven't got the Scooby what, what that is. So I will do more research though, and I'll let you know more details about that one. But remember, realistically, as a MacBook Air user, you know, how often do you really transfer all that data in one go? I do transfer terabytes sometimes, you know, in, in a day. It's, it's a completely different use case, you know, the Pro versus someone buying the MacBook Air. So my take on performance in this initial test that I've done and this kind of realistic multitasking, maybe a little bit over-realistic, right? Because I, I kind of added maybe too many tabs at one point and I'm editing multiple photos as well, I mean, some just to kind of to see how much I can push it. And the 16 gig of RAM for me, is the sweet spot for people who are, they're starting to dabble with creative applications like photo editing or maybe video editing even. But you know, they're not, they're doing a little bit more than just the multitasking 
um, kind of from a productive point of view. I feel that a gig would definitely be a struggle for me because you know that that swap would start to happen in quite a bit more. But I might have to reach out to some of my friend creators who you know here on YouTube. But do let me know if you're interested in that. Patrick Rambles and I think Mark Ellis both got the base model, so it might be a fun experiment that we might do something live or or as a video to compare by right? running the same number of apps, maybe the same doing the same things at which point the 8 gig struggles versus the 16 gig. And before I talk about the display and the battery, just a quick reminder, I have just downloaded some student apps as well for the, for the MacBook Air, and I'll be running them for a few days and do another video from a student's perspective. I'll probably be doing like a, a day in the life of a student. So make sure you are subscribed to the channel to watch that. And I'll probably do other as well. I don't know, maybe a lawyer or, you know, I don't know, give, give me some ideas on what to do as a, day in the life and I'll, I'll try and make that into a video. And YouTube can be weird sometimes, right? They, they might not recommend this video to the wider audience unless you interact with it. So if you liked it so far, please make sure to hit the thumbs up. And if you really like my stuff, of course, make sure to subscribe. The benefit to you, of course, is that I'm here at least once a week with a new tech video for you. Right, display and battery. I spent all evening last night kind of trying to, to really drive this machine. I did plug it in for a little bit to about, I don't know, 90% to, to charge it. And then this morning from 90%, I didn't plug it in and I used it for another three hours, maybe even four hours, not plugged in, just to simulate someone kind of working from a cafe, you know, picking the machine up in the morning, maybe not even fully charged, taking to a cafe and trying to work there or taking to school, for example. And the battery behaved beautifully. I mean, I'm pushing the machine quite a bit and I think it went down to about 70% by the time I was done with the, with the testing and multitasking, kind of half a day and I was still kind of 70% um, to go. So it was really good. Like I said, I had the display at full brightness because I have quite a bit of, you probably can't tell here in this video, but I, quite a bit of daylight in here. And it was very comfortable from a, from a brightness perspective as well. It's not too bright. It's, I don't know what the nits are. I haven't, <laughs> haven't read the specs yet, but it feels really comfortable. I didn't really feel like I was using anything different. Of course, this screen is a bit smaller than my MacBook Pro, but outside of that, it's, it's beautiful, you know, the display, the quality is great. I was watching some 4K and even 8K content at one point, no problem at all. Connecting to an external monitor, I've got this 4K monitor from Samsung, literally just plugging in the Thunderbolt cable into, into the monitor and it, you know, it's the right resolution, no issues. YouTube reckons uh, you're gonna like this video over here and I think you might enjoy this playlist that I've done here for you. Hope to see you there, bye.